Well, good evening and welcome to the Journey Home program. I'm your host, John Mark Grodi, and we are here tonight to sit back and relax and enjoy another story, a story of how our Lord Jesus Christ has opened uh, another heart through His grace uh, to the, the Holy Catholic Church. We're joined tonight by Father Sebastian Walsh. He's a Norbertine. He's a former Lutheran, but as we'll also hear in a moment, we've got some, some Jewish roots there as well. It's a pretty interesting story that I'm excited to hear. He's also the author of a number of books that we'll, we'll talk about later, but one of them uh, right off the bat you can check out is Always a Catholic, How to Keep Your Kids in the Faith for Life and Bring Them Back if They Have Strayed from the Catholic Church. And that's from uh, Catholic Answers Press. So check that out. But great to have you here tonight, Father. Thank you Father. so much. Real, real pleasure to be with you, John Mark. Yes. Thank you for having me. Uh, thank you for being here. Again, this, we were talking beforehand about the, the power of story, right? That's where we have to first, uh, we, we hear through somebody else's testimony, their witness to the gospel, how it changed mm -hmm. their life. And we need to find that in ourselves, too. And so that's, we're always here to hear a story, but also to be uh, reminded that, hey, we, we're in a story. We have to discover in our life how Christ is had changed us and made a difference. So excited to hear yours. Absolutely. Yeah. So why don't you take us back to the beginning? Where does it all, okay. all begin? Where does it all start? Yeah. Well, I guess, um, let me start just real quickly with my parents. Um, okay. My father uh, was raised Catholic, but he was not practicing as a result of, you know, he, he, he went to school in the 1950s at Notre Dame, which you would have thought, well, Notre Dame in the 1950s is like, you know, a bastion of Catholicism. Solid, yeah. But in those days, they were already kind of really um, undermining a lot of elements in the Catholic Church. And I hope Notre Dame's better now, to be honest. But he was there in the mid-50s. And a lot of things they taught him, you know, things like um, there's no devil, there's no hell. Um, the only thing you really need to be a good Catholic is you have to take care of the poor. You know, that sort of thing. A kind right. of a social justice message that ignored large elements of Catholic doctrine and Catholic dogma. And, um, and you know kind of shortly in, in the 60s what happened after that, you know. So he pretty much stopped practicing the Catholic faith. He was, you know, on and off every once in a while who would sometimes go to Mass, but was not a seriously practicing Catholic by the time I was born. Now, he married my mother, and that, the story of how they met is a rather uh, interesting, unusual story, so I might as well tell that one. My yeah, mom had a very rare disease of the nervous system. She was Jewish, and it was called dystonia. The, the long name is dystonia muscularum deformans. I think that's the long Latin name for it. And it resulted in a number of things, caused a constant cramping and spasticity in the muscles. And so she had to have a series of brain surgeries to halt the progress of the disease, but those surgeries left her mute, unable to talk, and crippled, you know, and so that she couldn't walk anymore after that. And that's a condition my, my dad met her in. Mm -hmm. And my dad was one of those people who could see through, you know, the cover and see the person. Oh. So they met when my dad was doing graduate studies at UCLA in psychology, and my mom was doing undergraduate. And uh, the story goes that um, my mom was, UCLA was one of the two colleges in the country at that time that had handicap facilities. So she had her little electric wheelchair, but if you know anything about UCLA, they've got these hills. Well, she was trying to get up one of these hills at UCLA in her wheelchair, and my dad thought he'd impress her. Um, he was a big man. I'm the, I'm the runt of the litter in my family. He was a big man. And he just picked her in her wheelchair up and ran up to the top of the hill and put her down. And he got a hernia. <laughs> oh, there. <laughs> so he gets his hernia, and um, he's in the hospital waiting for surgery for his hernia. And my mom shows up with a little toy mouse. And my dad just on the spot proposed. So it was a very quick wow. courtship. And um, anyway, so beautiful. <laughs> they got married. And the marriage was, was blessed by the church. It was not a big public Catholic marriage, but they, the, the priest witnessed it and was blessed by the church. But again, my dad was not really a practicing Catholic. My mom was a practicing Jew. So my brother and I basically were raised Jewish in our first years, till I was about seven. And, um, and at that time, I remember some things, interesting things about our, our Jewish worship. Um, we went to a place called Temple Beth Amy in Hacienda Heights, I think that was the name of it. And it was kind of a basilica-style synagogue. And you know what? They had a tabernacle in the front with a light next to it. And uh, Catholics are surprised to hear that because a lot of people don't realize, like, are the Catholic roots for like having a tabernacle and like a, a sanctuary lamp there for the tabernacle, that's all from Jew, Judaism. Right. And I remember they, instead of in the tabernacle, instead of having the body of Jesus, they had the Torah, the scroll. 
and they would take it out and unwind it and then read from it, you know? Right. And I remember asking about the light, you know, to one of the, the, the people who was there at the synagogue, and they said that that's the everlasting flame, they called it, and it never goes out. They always have the flame going there next to the tabernacle where the law of God is. And as a kid, I thought it was a miracle, you know what I mean? I didn't realize they were just switching out the candle, you know, when they would do that. But what it struck, it, years later when I became a Catholic, it, it made me realize how the roots of the Catholic faith are found in Judaism. And, um, and a lot of that was lost from some of the, you know, the time when I was a Lutheran, that they didn't understand, like, gosh, you know, a lot of these things that we have in the Catholic Church are, are still practices that were that came from Judaism. Right. Well, few Catholics know those. Yeah. You know, and it's really a um, it's really a poverty for Catholics because yes, so many uh, aspects of the Mass, so many aspects of the liturgy are just fulfillments of what the, what we see throughout the Old Absolutely. Testament, the Jewish worship. It's a really beautiful thing. I mean, the, there's great books out there for it, but it's something everybody should explore. Every Catholic. Yeah. Sure. So it was it was in a lot of ways it was beneficial for me to to go through that and I learned yeah. my Jewish prayers I still remember I remember all the little yeah. prayers we'd say before meals I have my little yarmulke mm -hmm. and everything anyway so we were raised Jewish and again my dad was you know he was fine with it because he he wasn't very serious about his Catholic faith and um, so my brother and I would would just do that we we did that till we were about seven till I was seven my brother was about nine and about that time. My mom had some pretty serious health problems that were kind of a side effect of this disease that she'd suffered from. And, and she had to go in for surgery because one of the effects of this dystonia was it would cause her, her spine was in a 180 degree scoliosis, is like mm. literally an S, yeah. as a result of all that spasticity she had when she was a girl. And so the organs were displaced and it, they were starting to fail because they were not in the right place. Mm. So she, she had to go into this very serious surgery. They, I was seven years old, they um, cut her open and literally had to crush her spine, straighten her out and put these metal rods in there, okay? So it was a very serious surgery. Right. My brother and I actually had to stay with an aunt and uncle for a couple months in Hawaii while she was recovering because my dad still had to work, he was a traveling salesman. So we were staying with our aunt and uncle there and, and when I got back, my mom was, you know, fine, she had this big kind of cast on with what's called a halo that was keeping her head immobile. But she told me this, this story of what happened. During the surgery, um, her heart stopped for about four minutes on the operating table. And she had one of these near-death experiences, right? These kind of out-of-body experiences. And I remember as a little kid, I asked her about it, you know, like, what happened here? Mm -hmm. And she said, well, I first thing I remember was I felt my soul separating from my body. And I noticed the pain went away. That was the first thing she noticed. And then she said, well, then I saw myself in a tunnel with a light at the end. And she said, and I thought I was going to see God. That's what she said. And apparently that happens with everyone, you know, they have the tunnel with a light at the end. It's always part of the account. Right. And she said, but instead I found myself hovering over my body. And, and she said, I remember thinking, why, are, why is everyone so upset because I'm so happy? She could see everyone kind of being in a panic trying to revive her. And I asked her, so what was it like? And she said it was like a tremendous sense of freedom. And as a little kid, I'm only seven, so when I think of freedom, I think you can go physical places. I said, could you have gone anywhere in the universe you wanted to? She said, I could have. I said, why didn't you? I said, I wanted to stay there, you know, where my body was. And I said, what happened next? She said, I, I had this experience of God's presence. I said, what was God like? She said, it was like he was pure love, like love itself. <laughs> Now, here's someone who had only read the Old Testament scriptures. And so she'd never read the passage in John, God is love, you know. But that's what she said. It was like experiencing love itself. And she said that he gave her a choice to go with him or to go back to her body. And she said, but I knew he wanted me to go back to my body, and he was so good I couldn't say no. And that's what she did. And then she remembered all the pain came back and whatever. But that was her experience in those four minutes that her heart had stopped on the operating table. Wow. Now that obviously profoundly affected her going forward. Yeah. And she shortly around, around that time, she met a man who was a Lutheran minister, a pastor, who spoke to her about the gospel, about Jesus, about God is love. And that really resonated with her. She never, like I said, she never knew any serious Catholics, you know, because my dad wasn't practicing at the time. And so, um, she became convinced that the, the Christian religion was true, and so she was baptized a Lutheran. 
and I was about eight years old. I was baptized as well. My brother was baptized. We're all baptized in the Lutheran Church. Now, years later, I found out, this is really funny. Years later, I found out that my dad, even though he was a non-practicing Catholic, he had some sense like, well, my kids should be baptized. So unbeknownst to my mom, he furtively baptized me in the sink. So my brother and I were both baptized in a sink somewhere. <laughs> which is um, which is kind of funny because every year I, I'm a Norbertine priest and at our abbey we have something called Paschal Vespers. And during Paschal Vespers you process from the sanctuary out to the baptismal font in the back of the church. And every year the prior would give the same homily where he would talk about making a spiritual pilgrimage to your baptismal font, you know. So everyone else is thinking about this nice little baptismal <laughs> font in their local parish church and I'm thinking of a sink in a junkyard and, you know, a hambra somewhere. It wasn't as edifying for me. But. Yeah. So I was actually baptized Catholic, as it turns out, and, the, and uh, I thought I'd been baptized Lutheran. But That's amazing. We're speaking tonight with Father Sebastian Walsh, an Orbertine and former Lutheran. So we're just, and we're just getting to that part of the story now, yep. uh, this, this transition to Lutheranism, to Christianity and Lutheranism. Um, we'll talk about that now, and, and, and in particular, so was how Lutheran were you? I mean, sometimes yeah. we have people who are in a particular sure. denomination, but the question is, yeah. You know, did you embrace that particular theology? Was that significant, or was it just yeah. the Christian church that you guys happened to show up at? So, okay, so I'm eight years old at this point, yeah. and of course, you know, who's a theologian eight years old? But yeah. I can say this, that um, I, we must have been, I don't think it was Missouri Synod, and I couldn't tell you exactly that the, I can tell you the name of, it was um, Mount Calvary Lutheran Church in Hacienda Heights was mm -hmm. the name of the church. And, but it was somewhat traditional for Lutherans because we would, there was an altar rail and we would kneel down and receive communion there, okay? So I remember that pretty well. And the pastor would go around, he had this big loaf of shepherd's bread, and he'd take a pinch out and give each person a pinch. And then someone else would come by with this big silver tray that had a little shot glass of wine in the bottom of each one of them, you know, a, a, just a little shot glass of wine. And then the altar rail had all these little circular notches and you could just put your shot glass in there, okay? So that's, you know, Protestants never received from the same chalice. It was non-hygienic, you know, it's kind of like... Yeah. So, uh, so there was something more traditional about that Lutheran church because of the fact you were kneeling for communion. Well, I wanted to receive communion. I was very excited about receiving communion. I was a little young for them. I think normally the age would have been nine that you would receive communion, but I wanted to receive communion right away. So I was really interested in communion. But I remember one time there's a little old lady who would gather up all the shot glasses that were left in those notches and back in that silver tray. And I noticed that there was some wine left at the bottom of a number of those. And I said to her, what do you do with that? And she said, I pour it in the bushes. And I was horrified. I said, you can't do that. That's the blood of Jesus. Now, this was kind of a remarkable thing because I'd never been taught that. The Lutheran, obviously, the Lutheran catechism, they wouldn't teach you that right. being like the actual blood of Jesus about transubstantiation. Um, but somehow I had a sense that's what it was supposed to be. Mm -hmm. And sometimes I give this as an example of having habitual faith just from your baptism. I just had a sense like right. that's supposed to be the blood of Jesus there. So, who and who was Jesus to you at this point? With that transition having been made to Lutheran Church, well, I I, know, I remember this. It was really interesting. I remember after my mom became a Christian, and we were baptized. Suddenly, Bibles appeared in our house, and I remember I was very fascinated. I started reading the Bible. I thought I'd start at the beginning, so I read Genesis, and through Exodus, I stopped dead at Leviticus. <laughs> I couldn't do it. You know, classic I, rookie mistake. Right, exactly. I couldn't. <laughs> I couldn't do it. But then I started reading the Gospels, yeah. and, I, and I got to know Jesus through reading the Gospels, okay. you know. So that was my first experience of, you know, who Jesus was. And, um, and I had, and the, you know, and they, they had edifying preaching at our Lutheran church, and I remember they had this thing where you'd give to the poor and you'd collect 30 pieces of silver, and what it was is like you would take dimes and nickels and quarters and put 30 pieces in and then give that to the poor or whatever the kids would, would save up for mm -hmm. that. So I had some sense of who Jesus was. Um, in any case, I still had this kind of deep desire for the Eucharist, strangely, that was just in me right from the beginning somehow. Right. And when I got to be about 10 years old, all those health problems that my mom had really kind of came to a, a head, and she passed away when I was 10. Mm -hmm. And the, that was so traumatic for my dad that over the next six months, his, his health really failed. He had ended up ending up ended up having a heart attack. He had to go to the hospital. 
And my brother and I were then left to basically, in those, especially the last couple months when my dad was sick, he was so sick that he couldn't even like get up in the morning and things like that. And, and it was really, you know, my brother was like 12 years old at the time and he was driving to the supermarket to get groceries for us, you know. Yeah. It was a really difficult time in our life. And um, in any case, our dad had the heart attack. We were able to call 911, the, the ambulance came, he was able to go to the hospital. But he was pretty much under medical care for months after that. And my father's mother, who was a practicing Catholic, took my brother and I in during that time. And she really became a second mom to us, our grandmother in, in Pasadena. Mm -hmm. And she had in her library there a number of Catholic volumes, including one old, very venerable tome that said, the name of it was the Compendium of Catholic Knowledge. I remember being very impressed. It looked like it had spells in it or something. You know, <laughs> took it down off the shelf. It was printed in like 1897 or something. And I opened it up and I would read these things. And there was a whole section on the Eucharist there and the Catholic reasons from Scripture for the Eucharist. And at this time, I'm about 13 years old, or 12, well, not even that, 12. But those arguments made perfect sense to me. And at some point, I just became convinced, well, the Catholic Church is right about the Eucharist. What were some of those arguments, you know, what in particular? Yeah, well, you know, that I remember yeah. one of the arguments just had to do with the, the Last Supper discourse. Um, I remember the, um, the author, he was a priest, he said, you know, the Greek language has more than 20 different ways to say symbolizes, represents, you yeah. know, or whatever. None of those words are used. Jesus didn't say, this represents my body, this symbolizes my body. He said, this is my body. And then it went into chapter 6 of John, and it went and explained how Jesus um, over and over again reiterates. And, and the challenge, I remember, the challenge in the, in the text was, if what else could Jesus have said if he was trying to preach the real presence? Right. You know, how, how could he have made his language stronger? And I remember thinking, like, it's true. I don't know what else he could have said that would have made it more real, you know? Right. So those arguments really um, I found convincing, and they corresponded to my innate faith that I had to begin with. Yeah. I really realized, like, that's what I always believed and what I, th I thought in my heart was true. Yeah, that, that's so, really interesting that because we, we hear from many converts in their testimony, <clears throat> you know, that they... They experienced Christ in the Eucharist when they attended the Mass. They had a sense yeah. of presence or they, they had a longing for the Eucharist. That's a common thing. It seems that that's even more significant in your story because of your Jewish roots. Yeah. Where there, there's a, you know, we, we often talk about there's a God-sized hole in the human heart. Right? Yeah. Well, there's a, there's a Eucharist-shaped hole <laughs> in, in many Protestant theologies. That it, yeah. it's, it's, there's, there's a lot of good there, but there, there's a longing for what's missing, which is, again, even in Judaism where you had the tabernacle, you had the word of God. You had yes. this reverence, but it was it was a foreshadowing. It was pointing pointing towards God becoming man, yes, and being with us forever, you know, bodily. And so the, you know, the it's always interesting to see those intuitions that there is there's something to the Eucharist that this this fits my humanity. This yeah. fits my faith. I think that's really true. Yeah, yeah. I, I had that sense. So, <laughs> so that was the kind of on the intellectual side that was really essential for my conversion. <laughs> Now, the other side that needed to be helped was my heart. And, and I'll back up a little bit. In the, in the months and year or two following my mother's death, my father's um, getting sick, I remember this is a, I didn't tell this part of the story, but it's a really important part. I came home and I found my mom dead. That's what happened when I came oh, wow. home. I got home, I was 10 years old, I'd gone off to school, and I came home and, and I found her there in the kitchen and I um, went and called 911 right away, and I could feel, I could see she, her body was cold. I knew she was dead. But when the ambulance came, they had me wait in the ambulance. And I remember very distinctly, I was crying, I was praying to God, and I said to God at some point in my prayer, I said, it's okay that you took my mom. It's even okay if you take my dad, but never let me lose you. You know, and I think about that prayer. I don't know how a 10-year-old boy can make that prayer. But it was a, a moment of great grace from, from God. And I think it was what merited my own conversion to the Catholic faith and eventually even my priestly vocation. But, um, you know, the, while I had those strong intentions at the beginning, the difficulty of my life in those years after my mom's death, my dad's sickness and whatever, became very difficult for me. 
And so eventually I ended up lose, you know, leaving off the practice of any faith whatsoever. I became a little 10-year-old agnostic slash atheist or whatever. I remember saying stuff to myself like, well, if God's everywhere, why do I have to go to church? You know, instead of thinking like, well, if God's everywhere, I should behave everywhere like it's church. You know, I didn't, it, you know, yeah. the logical consequences didn't come to me. So yeah. all those difficulties of kind of disintegration of my family life, the things that were happening caused a lot of difficulties. So after my um, dad went to the hospital and my brother and I ended up moving with our grandmother, it stabilized things a lot in our family. And... And then my grandmother had the good sense. At first, we wanted her to take us to the Lutheran church, but she was always going to the Catholic church. So she said, it's good enough for me. It's good enough for you. You can come to the Catholic church. And she had the good sense to know they need to get uh, friendships with young people. So she told us, you have to go to the youth group, you know, for the, the, the young high school kids um, at the Catholic church. So that's what we did. And for the first time in my life, I met Catholics who were practicing, who were fervent, and actually had a personal loving relationship with Jesus. Before that time, everything I heard about the Catholic faith was just basically, well, it's, you know, form, it's just a bunch of rituals or whatever. And I didn't have any sense that you could be a, a Christian who loved Jesus and had a personal relationship with Christ and be a Catholic at the same time, you know. So that was the other half of my heart that needed to be fixed, you know, that I needed to see that this is a, um, you know, it's really possible to grow in love for Christ, to be a deep Christian and have a deep faith in God as a Catholic. So those two things together, having that kind of, those obstacles, those misconceptions about the Catholic faith taken away by those good people that I met in that youth group, St. Philip's, the Apostle Church in Pasadena, and then having that intellectual conversion, both those things convinced me by the time I was 13 years old, I want to be a Catholic. Yeah. Now, in those days, I got right under the wire. In those days, before all the RCIA programs had started. Right. So, literally, I just went to the local, the, the, the Catholic church, the associate pastor at the parish. And uh, Father Daly was an Irish priest. And I went and had six meetings with him, just six weeks or something. And after that, I was received in the Catholic church, you know. And uh, I was going already to the eighth grade and, um, at St. Philip's there. And uh, so, I was getting catechism also in that eighth grade class. And I was confirmed and brought in the Catholic Church as a 13-year-old kid. So that's that's more or less how I got sure. in the church. What did your dad think about all this? You know, it's interesting. My dad was always, you know, he was, you know, in favor. My dad was always kind of laissez-faire with regard to things like that. He'd just say, you know, I'm happy for you, son. I just want you to be happy, you know, which in a lot of ways was very freeing and really helpful. I do wish he'd been a little bit more directive and instructive about certain things. But again, his faith was also kind of weak, you know. Um, years later, as I grew in my faith, he started to come back and be stronger in his faith, thanks be to God. And so, um, but he was happy. He was happy that I was becoming a Catholic, you know. Yeah. Uh, my brother eventually followed suit. He wasn't ready as soon as I was. And then when he kind of was ready a couple years later, uh, then they had a long kind of program. He was just starting college. And because of that, he couldn't do the program at the parish and be at college at the same time. So he actually waited until basically... So he got done with college and he fell in love with a, a Catholic girl and wanted to marry her. So in order to get married in the Catholic Church um, as a Catholic, he, he eventually um, went through with the RCIA program, was confirmed probably when he was about 20, 21, right. something right. like that. So well, we're going to take a, a little break there. Perfect. Uh, and we'll come back uh, and, you know, there's a lot of living to happen left after you become yeah, Catholic. The journey continues and obviously whenever we have... Uh, a priest or religious on, we want to hear that story as well, because that's that's an important part of how that story plays out, is that finding not just the church, but then your particular vocation in the church. So we'll hear more about, about that in the Norbertine Absolutely. Order, as well as your as you got some neat books that you've written. So we'll be back here in a couple minutes to talk more with Father Sebastian Walsh. Uh, I, I want to remind you, as always, uh, that if you have a story, we want to hear it. We want to hear how you came to discover the Catholic Church. So reach out to us at chnetwork.org. Uh, you'll find there many conversion stories, like Father Sebastian's, uh, from every conceivable background. But we, but your every person's story is important. Every person's story will touch somebody else. So we want to hear yours. So share it with us there. We'll be back in just a couple minutes to hear the rest of Father Sebastian's story. See you then.
Well, welcome back to the Journey Home program. I'm your host, John Mark Grodi, here for the second half of the hour. We're talking tonight uh, to Father Sebastian Walsh. Uh, he's of the Norbertine Order. We're going to hear more about that in a little bit. He's also a former Lutheran and has Jewish roots that we've heard his great story in the first half. Uh, and we, we left off, you just, again, as a, as a young teenager, you know, through this journey, discovering the Eucharist, as well as then finding community, uh, you ended up becoming Catholic. And so we're going we're to pick that back up, talk, uh, if you would, uh, about the aftermath of that and how the, the story continues. Sure, yeah, yeah, absolutely. So, so once I became a Catholic, you know, that youth group that I belonged to is pretty yes. fervent, you know, and they would encourage things like daily Mass and things like that. I would occasionally, like, you know, here and there go to daily Mass. I started going to a Catholic high school, Salesian High School, called Don Bosco Tech out in Rosemead. And, um, and one thing that I noticed is really interesting. They had daily mass there at the, uh, at the high school. And I, would, I used to take the bus in, it was about two, 20 miles from where I lived. It took about an hour to get there by bus. So I was getting up really early in the morning, taking one bus, transferring to another bus. And we, get, we would get there about an hour before school started. And so I always had a choice every morning. My choice was, should I go play basketball with my friends or should I go to mass, right? And I always wanted to play basketball, right? But I noticed something that's really interesting. It's kind of like a discernment moment that St. Ignatius had. I noticed that all the mornings where I went and played basketball, at the end of it, I'd be kind of hot and irritated and kind of in a bad mood. But all the mornings I would go and, and attend mass, I remember feeling like peaceful and really joyful afterwards. And I always found it fascinating, like, why is it do I really look forward to going to basketball more than mass when at the, kind of the after effect, I noticed there was such a big difference, you know? Right. So eventually I just kind of decided, okay, I'm going to go to mass, you know, and I'll play basketball later. And that was happy. It was kind of really interesting. But that was kind of the first thing, getting that opportunity to go to daily mass in high school that nourished my love for the Eucharist. Um, I did not think at all about the priesthood at that point. It wasn't really anything I was interested in. Um, I went off to college. I was pretty young when I went to college. I went to a place called UC Irvine, and I studied electrical engineering there. I was good at math, and so that's what I pursued. And, um, and I remember thinking, oh, I want to be a real <clears throat> serious Catholic, so I thought about being like a missionary. I wasn't thinking at all of the priesthood. I thought, well, missionary, that'd be something that I could do that would be like, you know, all in on the Catholic faith. But as the kind of time went on, I was, you know, just the ways of the world, I got, you know, I just got involved in a lot of sports and just that idea of being a missionary just sort of faded from my mind as unrealistic and then eventually I kind of thought, well, I'll have my, you know, wife and 2.5 children, my upper middle class lifestyle and income, you know. So I got out of engineering school at UC Irvine. I got a wonderful job at an intellectual property law firm down in Newport Beach and, and within a year, I had achieved most of my life goals financially. You know, mm. I was getting more money than I could spend. I was, I had this window office looking at the Pacific Ocean, you know, my own secretary and all this stuff is really uh, financially and professionally, everything was really good. And I looked forward to coming to work. I worked, I, I, I wrote patents, you know, for um, inventions and things like that. And they're super interesting. I really look forward to coming to work each day. But I noticed, I said, gosh, you know, here I am achieving like most of my life goals and I thought it would be more fulfilling, you know. It wasn't that I, that I was unhappy, but I thought, there, I thought it'd be more yeah. than what it was. And I knew a really good Catholic family that lived close to me in Pasadena um, that had gone to high school, some of their boys had gone to high school with me. They were a huge Catholic family, They're the, the Grimm family, that 17 kids. Wow. And the last four were boys, and I kind of fell right in the middle of those four. And they were the closest family to me from my high school. Like I said, I was, we were 20 miles away. So during the summers, I spent all my you know, time kind of socializing with those kids, those boys from that family. And they really encouraged me to think about like a really serious Catholic college, uh, Thomas Aquinas College. All their kids would go to Thomas Aquinas, mm -hmm. and I just thought it was unrealistic, I, you know, whatever. I said, I'll study that stuff on my own. So I got to my senior year at UC Irvine, and I remember, you know, oh, I'll get a book off the shelf from Thomas Aquinas, and I see in this, you know, this book, it says, On Being and Essence. It's like that thick. It's a tiny, harmless little book, you know, so I take it out. <laughs> I open it up. It turns out it was one of these books on metaphysics, you know, and St. Yeah. Thomas had written it, and it was just going like, bing, bing, like <laughs> nothing was going in, you know. So I thought, this isn't working. And then um, 
Uh, but then the, the father of that family, uh, Bill Grimm, I told him, I'm like, oh, I tried to read that book. It didn't, I didn't understand it. And he said, here, take this one. He gives me a book by Boethius called The Constellation of Philosophy. It was a lot easier. And I was reading that. And I, it turned out that summer, my brother and I went and did a, a vacation up in Saskatchewan. Went to southern Saskatchewan to the Moose Jaw Mountains, a place called Kenosi Lake. And it was in the summer, so the sun got up really early. And I remember going down to the lake and just but dangling my feet in the, in the water off the dock and reading Boethius. <laughs> and it was amazing, you know? Like all these things that I was thinking about, he would say, but he would say it in a better way. But it, it was exactly what I was thinking. And I could realize like this, he's talking about reality here. He's not just making something up because it was the same way I was trying to interpret reality, but he would say it in a clearer way that, that made sense to me. And that was the first time I fell in love with philosophy, you know? So after doing that, I thought to myself, you know what? I think I'm going to give up this job that I have and go back and study philosophy at Thomas Aquinas College, which made my grandmother cry. And, you know, my dad was very, like I told you, my dad was very supportive. My dad's like, son, I want you to be happy. It's always that, you know? Mm -hmm, so mm -hmm. off I went. And uh, fortunately, that law firm, they, they were so good to me. They said, look, don't quit. We'll give you a computer. We'll give you a modem. You work part time. You come back and work during the summers and we'll take you back when you're done. They were so generous to me and I'm always grateful to them. And I was able to work my way and pay my way through college that way. Um, but it was really my time at Thomas Aquinas College that I really deepened my Catholic faith. I went from being kind of what I, what I might call an American parish Catholic to a traditional Catholic that really understood deeply the elements of the faith, you know? Yeah. So um, it was there that I first started seriously thinking about a vocation. Now I started right away um, dating someone my freshman year because I was an older student. I was already 21. I thought it's time to get married and I was really interested in finding, you know, a good wife. So I started dating someone, but I think it was in my sophomore year, we had, there was a nation retreat, a silent retreat that happened over the Easter Triduum. And I remember St. Ignatius kept on, you know, saying, do everything for the greatest glory of God. What can you do that's for the greatest glory of God? I remember sitting there in the retreat thinking like, well, probably being a priest would be for the greatest glory of God, but I didn't want to be a priest, you know? But the whole point of the retreat was letting go of your fears and like choosing the greatest thing and not being afraid to do that, you know? So I really, really just said, okay, all right, God, I'll, I, I can try this, you know? And so I went to my girlfriend and I told her, I think I'm supposed to be a priest. And we broke up and I cried and she cried. And I, for three days, I did not eat. I was so sad. So then I went to the other priest on campus, the one who wasn't the Jesuit, and um, I told him, I can't eat. I'm so sad. He says, son, if you're not at peace, then that's not God's will for you. So I said, great. So then I was happy again. I got back together with my girlfriend. Everything was fine. <laughs> mm -hmm. um, but this thing was still there, kind of planted in my heart. It was still there. It always kind of slow, you know, it was always gnawing at me, I guess. And so I, I um, the girl I was dating was a couple years ahead of me in college. So she had graduated uh, by the time I was starting my junior year. And, and by that point, I think there was just, she really wanted to get married earlier. I wanted to finish school. There were a lot of arguments that came up. I look back on it now and I think how strange that it didn't end up in, in a marriage because she was a really wonderful woman. I learned a lot about being a man from, from being in that relationship. But I knew now, looking back, that was God kind of throwing a wrench mm -hmm. in things because he wanted me to be a priest. So things didn't work out. I went off to study um, philosophy at Catholic University, did some graduate work. Okay. And while I was there, I, I met a young man who's a seminarian from the Diocese of Raleigh, North Carolina. We got to be really close friends. His name was Tim Mears. He's still a, a priest there in, in uh, Little Rock. In, um, um, in the Diocese of Raleigh in North Carolina. And so he really encouraged me. You know, he said, well, why don't you think about being a priest? And I really respected him. And there's a saying Aristotle has, he says, a friend is like another self. Yeah. And I was able to realistically see myself as a priest through my friend, you know? So at this time I wasn't dating anyone. And so I felt a little bit more emotional freedom. And I'd known about uh, the Abbey, St. Michael's Abbey, through a friend of mine who I'd gone to school with um, at Thomas Aquinas College, who had been a seminarian with them. 
And he encouraged me to go and visit. So I did this two week long come and see visit at St. Michael's Abbey. It was a Christmas, two weeks before Christmas in 1997. And I get there and it was really hard. You know, they prayed all the time. And to save money, they didn't have lights on at night. And so they had these little like night lights. It's like Christmas and it was like dark and depressing, you know, and I remember thinking to myself, I remember crying myself to sleep saying, am I gonna go to bed by myself for the rest of my life? You know, that's literally how I felt, you know. Um, and I would be praying the Psalms. I'd look ahead to see if they were short, you know, because <laughs> it was too hard for me. So it's there just, I was. Is this I one was, of the four liners or I one was, of the... <laughs> I, oh my gosh, you had no idea. It was just, and so it was very difficult. And you would have thought like, gosh, well, why on earth did this guy join that abbey? Well, while I was there, I was doing spiritual reading. I read the Gospel of Matthew, and in, in that passage in Matthew 19, Jesus says, let he who is able to accept this teaching accept it about consecrated celibacy. And for the first time, I'd read that passage a dozen times or more. For the first time it occurred to me, Jesus did not say, let he who feels like it, hmm. but let he who is able. It's kind of a liberating moment for me. <clears throat> so I said to myself, the only thing I need to figure out here is can I do this? And something I noticed in my two weeks there at the Abbey, it was easier at the end than it was at the beginning. Mm -hmm. And I took that as a sign from God, okay, I should at least try. But I really wasn't someone who's excited about being a priest. I basically told God, you get one shot, I'm not trying again. If this doesn't work out, it's not gonna, it's not for me. And I was kind of hoping they would kick me out. I know that sounds <laughs> terrible, but it's true. That's how I, that's really how I felt. I just, I wanted to have a family, I wanted to be married, yeah. but I wanted to give God the first shot, you know? Mm -hmm. So I go, I join the Abbey. It was a tough two years, my first two years before vows. But at some point, again, the scriptures came to my rescue. I was reading the Book of Wisdom, and it says about those who, who give up children for the kingdom of God, that they will receive a more satisfying inheritance in the temple of the Lord. They're eunuchs. He's talking about the eunuchs for the kingdom. And, it, and then it occurred to me, you know, everything good in a wife that I would have had and all my children, those would have been from God. And so having a wife and children would have been basically experiencing those things in a mediated way. But if I give up a wife and children for the sake of God in this life, I'm going to receive directly in God's essence whatever it is corresponds to that goodness. And when I put it to myself that way, I said, I'm not giving up marriage and family. I'm putting it off for 60 years for a better experience of it. Hmm. And that's what made it morally possible for me to become a priest. It was really that moment of light. So in both those cases, it was the scriptures that really came to my rescue um, and my love for the Eucharist, you know. Right. So I decided to take vows. The moment I took vows, all my darkness, all my sadness went away. Hmm. And from that point on, I was always happy and peaceful. Um, and I always tell people my vocation was like an arranged marriage. I, I fell in love with it after I chose it, huh. you know. So that's kind of, that's how I became a priest. So. That's wonderful, Father. I mean, let's, let's just before we go on, let's just talk about that discernment for a moment, because obviously we have lots of students out there, um, or even not maybe not students, maybe people you know later on in their lives still trying to figure out that vocation, and that that question of of feelings versus your ability. I, I remember I was spent a brief time in seminary, yeah, and I remember those those questions, right? <clears throat> if I'm I wanted to be a serious Catholic, and so uh, that must mean I'm called to be a priest. Mm. I don't, don't want to be a priest. How, how, what, can you give some advice to students who are going through those thoughts, how to, yeah. how to pray through? Because there's feelings and feelings. Yes. Right? How yeah. do you approach that, sure. that question? So, look, here's what I tell people. I yeah. can put, I can get, a doctor can give you a shot in the arm and make you feel good. Yeah. Or can give you a shot in the arm and make you feel bad. Right. You cannot let your feelings be the essential determinant in your vocation. Okay? We're not German shepherds. We're human beings, mm. you know? And thank goodness, we don't have to live a simply animal life, you know? And you will wake up in whatever vocation you have. If you're a priest, if you're a married person, you're going to wake up thinking, what did I do? I don't want to be here right now. You look across at your wife thinking like, what have I got myself into? She's probably looking, the, you think the same thing, right? Or you're a priest and you're just like, you wake up and you're just like, I don't want to be a priest today. And that doesn't matter. <clears throat> it doesn't matter what you feel like on a given day. So <clears throat> when I give young people advice about that, I tell them, look, here's a couple things you need to look for. One, do you feel pulled or pushed? Mm -hmm. If you feel pulled, that's a good sign. If you feel pushed, it might be pressure from outside forces. You really need to have a sense of being pulled 
towards a vocation rather than pushed. The second thing is, it's not just an emotional pull. It might have that sometimes, but the essence of it is, it's a sense of something great that you, you, your heart really wants to do. I compare it to a young man who wants to give his life for his country. Right. You know, there's no emotional joy associated with the idea of like the thought of dying, but there's a sense of nobility. I want to do something that's truly great and noble. Huh? So those two things. And then last of all, when you look at what a priest does, what is it most of all you want to do? You know, I always give a list like preaching, saying mass, hearing confessions, giving spiritual direction, administering a parish, whatever, right? What I've noticed is almost invariably, it's the ones that say, I want to say mass. Yes. Those are the ones that have an authentic vocation because that's the heart of the priesthood. It's all about the Eucharist. Everything's about the Eucharist. My whole life, the reason I'm a Catholic is because of the Eucharist. The reason I'm a priest is because of the Eucharist. The Norbertine order drew me because it's centered on the Eucharist. St. Norbert always has a Eucharist in his hand and iconography. <laughs> so everything's about the Eucharist. Um, and so that's what a priest needs to do. Everything a priest does, when he hears confessions, it's so that people can receive the Eucharist. If he preaches a homily, it's to ignite their hearts on fire for Jesus in the Eucharist, to receive the Eucharist fruitfully. Right? Everything a priest does is for the sake of the Eucharist and, and uniting the faithful to Jesus in the Eucharist. So that's the, that's the advice I, I give. I think that's really excellent advice, you know, and it seems like a corollary of, of, those, of those points of discernment is that we need to be really clear, clear-headed, clear-minded on what those vocations really are. If we're thinking mm -hmm. about the married life, if we're thinking about the priesthood or the religious life, we need to learn about them. A young person should, be, should feel this freedom to learn about them, you know, yeah. go in and explore because we want to get really clear what we're talking about here. We're not just thinking about, you know, a life with, you know, a sexual partner versus, like some people think of it yeah, in yeah. terms of yeah, that. Yeah. Right. And we're not just thinking of the priesthood as, oh, this is a life where I get to be up in front of people. That's what it's about. No, 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 no. no yeah. Priesthood is about the Eucharist. It's about yes. being a person of Christi, the sacraments. Married life is about this call. And I, and I like, I love the, that thought, you know, thinking of them in terms of this, this great call that you feel pulled towards. Mm -hmm. You know, what's the great thing, the magnanimous thing that God's calling you to do in your life? That's a great way, it, sure. that's the term to think about it. Terms, so. one, one thing I'll often say to a young person who's kind of trying to still figure it out, I say, let me ask you this question. Yeah. If you got magically transported to the last moment of your life, you're just about to take your last breath, yeah. what would you have rather been? You know, would you have rather been a priest and offered all those masses, forgiven all those sins, or would you have rather been a married man and have all those children and grandchildren raise them in the faith? Mm. What that question does is it takes away the fear element because we tend to avoid a vocation out of fear. Right. You know, and if you're afraid of the suffering involved in being a priest, you know, then you might not want to be a priest. And conversely, if you're afraid of the suffering involved in married life, you might not want to be married. But what that does is it isolates your true desire, you know. And so, anyway, I think that's a really good question for young people to ponder when they're thinking about their vocation. For sure. Yeah, to think about the fruit. You know, what fruit is God calling you to, to yeah. work out? Yeah. Beautiful. Okay, so the, you, you, again, you enter the Norbertine. Tell us a little bit about the Norbertine order and their charism. Okay. Sure. Yeah. So our order was founded in 1121 on Christmas Day. We just celebrated 900 years uh, this last Christmas. And it was founded by St. Norbert, who, who started off as a nobleman who wasn't living a very edifying life, but God converted him much like St. Paul, literally threw him off his horse. And he had this deep conversion, started going around barefoot in the snow as an itinerant preacher. Eventually the Pope, you know, told him, look, we, you know, this whole itinerant thing, I'm not sure about that, why don't you go start a monastery? So he did, he gathered around people around himself, and he, um, he founded a, a, our first house of our order in the Valley of Prémontré in France, which, uh, which is the reason why we're called Prémontretensions, it's kind of a long Latin <laughs> name, but that's, that's the other name for our order, Norbertines or Prémontretensions. And from there, um, the order grew and expanded, I think at one point within about a hundred years after the death of St. Norbert, there were something like 10,000 men and 10,000 women in the Norbertine order at a time when the church was much smaller. It was one of the largest uh, orders in the church. And it was part of the Gregorian reform movement. Really what happened was Pope St. Gregory VII, he died in exile, but there was the cl clergy and the religious were living corrupt lives, you know, for the most part in Europe at the time. So he reformed the canon law, but he died seemingly without any effect. But 50 years later, God rose up two really great figures. He rose up St. Bernard of Clairvaux, who helped to reform the religious side through the Cistercians there. Right? And then St. Norbert, 
who helped to reform the clerical side. And that was a real great movement and spur in the church that then eventually um, went to people like St. Francis of Assisi, St. Dominic, um, and so forth, you know, the founding of these great religious orders at that time. Um, that was the reason for our order, was basically to reform the clergy. And I think about it today. The, the, the thing, my favorite thing to do today is to give retreats to priests. Yes. Because it helps me reform the clergy. I feel like I'm doing what our order was founded to, to do. And I teach philosophy to our seminarians at the Abbey. And so I also get to form future priests that way too. Wonderful. So that's the reason why we exist. We were talking beforehand, my, my younger brother, I have two brothers, but the middle brother just became a priest a couple years ago that's great. in our diocese. And so I have, I have a real heart for you know, <laughs> priests and other people who are taking care of our priests, yeah. you know, forming them, encouraging them, building them up, because uh, there's a lot of spiritual battle that goes around that vocation. And sure. so to have people who are helping them uh, is a big deal. Uh, that's a joy for me. It's, 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 like I said, my favorite thing to do. Yeah. So, What's the rule of life like for a Norbertine? You know, well, um, yeah. I don't know if it's the same, for, it's not the same for every abbey, sure. but we at our abbey, we're very focused on the Mass is the central thing, the Eucharist. So we begin and end our day with the Eucharist. We have Mass in the morning, every morning at 7, and we have the uh, Eucharist holy hour every evening around 8. So that's our hinges of our day. Yeah. Before Mass, we get up, we have... Uh, the divine office starting at 545, you know, and then followed immediately by law. So we say all seven hours of the divine office Beautiful. in our church and sing them all. We yeah. sing every one of them. Then in addition to that, we have the mass. And then we have um, in the afternoon, late afternoon, we have uh, known followed by rosary, followed by vespers, and then dinner. We eat our meals in common and we pray in common. And uh, and with kind of all the time we're together in the church, we're, we're in church about four and a half, five hours every day saying our prayers. And that's one of the essential things that St. Norbert wanted. He wanted priests living together, he wanted them praying together, and he wanted the Mass and liturgy to be worthily celebrated, not only outwardly, which we really focus on in our ad. We have a lot of beautiful chant, Norbertine chant, and Latin, and beautiful um, liturgy, but also inwardly, that our hearts are prepared to receive Jesus and to worthily celebrate the sacred mysteries. Huh? So that life of uh, penance and um, asceticism that prepares you to, to be united to Christ and to be separated from the things of this life that, that, that distract you from Christ. Yeah. So that's how we try to live our life at our Abbey. And it's been very beautiful and very successful. I, have, I feel like it's dumb luck. I just ran into this. I didn't even know the difference between a, a diocesan priest and a religious priest yeah. when I joined our Abbey. So well, That's so beautiful. We have about seven minutes left. And what I would like you to talk about now um, it's it's funny. This is something that we have to think about as Catholics, right? We want to we want to bear good fruit. You know, whatever yeah. vocation we're called to, uh, we want to serve the Lord and bring about the fruit that He's calling us to. We we often <laughs> struggle, especially we lay people. We struggle with well, how much do I pray and, and work, and how do I fit it all in time wise? Yeah. And it, boy, it sounds like in a life like yours that it's it's all prayer. How would you have time to do anything else? But you do <laughs> do other things. You have your ministry, and you've actually written some some books. Uh, one that we were going to mention here is this, um, uh, Always a Catholic, How to Keep Your Kids in the Faith for Life and Bring Them Back if They Have Strayed. Talk about that book and then about you know the other th other sure. aspects of your ministry and your writing sure. that you've, yeah. you've done. So um, I have this enduring memory as a child. I would see my mom typing away. I'd be, she'd be in her wheelchair typing away, and I'd be a little kid, like three years old, and playing with a toy on the ground. I'd see my mom <laughs> typing. So my brother and I must have ingested that because both my brother and I love to write, you know. Yeah. So in my, this is literally, any writing I do is just in little tiny snippets of free time, spare time that yeah. I have, which isn't very much, but, mm -hmm. but I do it. I like to use my time fairly well for that. So um, that book, Always a Catholic, that started out as a talk. Okay. As a priest, I noticed the number one question I was asked by Catholic parents was, um, I sent my kids to 12 years of Catholic school. Why aren't they Catholic? What can I do to get my children back in the faith? That was a big question that everyone had. And I had a lot of experience myself. I had a lot of experience through really good Catholic families like this Grimm family I told you about. All 17 kids stayed in the faith. And pretty much every single one of their 100 and something grandchildren and 100 and something great grandchildren in the faith, you know? So I seen how it was done well and I'd seen the mistakes that people made so I started formulating a little talk, and I gave a, a couple talks on this. And in one of those talks, uh, there was an apologist from Catholic Answers there, and that uh, apologist said, you need to put that into a book. So that's what I did. Uh -huh. I literally, I sat down for two weeks. I had a two-week break 
and I just wrote like a madman for hours each day, just in, in, in all my spare time, and put that little book together. It's just advice for parents, how to keep your kids Catholic, what do you do to keep your kids Catholic, and at the same time, if they've left, what can you do to be most effective in helping them return, you know? And as a priest, I'm really optimistic because I've done so many deathbed conversions, you know, where I've yeah. gone to someone on their deathbed, they've been away from the faith for like 40 years, and they tell me my mom was a Catholic. You know, she always prayed for me, and then like I bring them right back to the faith right before they die. Yeah. So I have all sorts of confidence that God's going to work those things out, and I, I try to communicate that in this book. So Beautiful. And what, what, is there a, a point that you give us? What, what were, what's some of your... Some of the thrusts there. You know, yeah. Okay. A bit of advice you could give that. I certainly want people to pick up the well, book. Well, first you know? of all, no one's going to. No, your kids are not going going to want to be Catholic unless they see you're happy as a Catholic. Yeah. You have to attach their Catholic faith to their happiness. If they don't see the connection between those two things, they're not going to stay Catholic. Doesn't matter what you do. Right. So number one, like you have to be happy as a Catholic. Number two, in, in any marriage it's almost always that you're going to have one is a little bit more devout than the other, sometimes much more devout, mm -hmm. right? And I say, look, don't make the Catholic faith a wedge between you and your spouse. Mm -hmm. Your Catholic faith tells you that the believing husband sanctifies the unbelieving wife, the believing wife sanctifies the unbelieving husband. Mm -hmm. Being a Catholic means that you're more affectionate, more loving, closer to your spouse that's an unbeliever, not someone who's constantly criticizing them, because that's a mistake a lot of Catholics make. And then the kids see, the Catholic faith drives a wedge between my parents. Why do they want that? You know? It has to be something that always brings their parents together. Okay? So that's that from the standpoint of like being, keep, keeping your kids Catholic. Yeah. From the standpoint of helping them come back, the main thing is God loves your children more than you do. You've got to trust that. Your children don't have amnesia. You don't have to browbeat them. They need to know that you love them regardless of whether or not they're practicing Catholics. And, and that you want them to have the Catholic faith because it's going to help them in those dark times of their lives that are inevitably going to come. So those are some little tidbits of advice I give. Wonderful advice. You know, I, I think it's been mentioned many times here, but when Mother Angelica uh, first invited my father to do this mm. program, that was her concern that she'd heard, from, like, like you had heard from so many Catholic parents um, and just Catholics in general saying, you know, my, my kids have left. Hmm. You know, my sister or my brother, and how do I invite them back? And um, we were talking at the beginning of the program and beforehand that it's one of the reasons the stories are important because, mm -hmm. as you said, that has to be lived in your life. You know, what you tell them has to be connected to what they actually see in your relationship yeah. and in your family. And so, yeah, so check out that book uh, for sure. Uh, it's always a Catholic. Uh, I can't see the rest of the subtitle here, That's but right. it's available from Catholic Answers. Sure. Great book. You have a couple other books. You have one on the, on yeah, the, the parables. One on called Secrets from Heaven, also from Catholic Answers, on, on uh, the conversations and parables of Jesus. I told you how Scripture was so instrumental in my vocation. Hmm. And um, so I have just love Scripture, and I spend a lot of time just reading it and trying to understand it better. So I try to apply the principles of the fathers and doctors of the church there on how to interpret Scripture. And, and it's been a very well-loved book. I think a lot of people have found a lot of help in understanding how to read Scripture better through that one. I wrote a book on understanding marriage and family, which is more educational than inspirational because I taught high school students, and the number one apologetic question they had is, you know, how do you defend the Catholic teaching on marriage today mm -hmm. and family? So I wrote a whole book on that, and so those things are already published. Um, I also wrote for my high school kids a series of philosophy books that's going to be coming out from TAN. Yeah. Um, philosophy is so important, just being able to think about reality correctly for being able to deal with the errors that have crept into the modern world and to keep your kids Catholic, just having the ability to think correctly about things and conform their mind to reality. Yeah. And then finally some books on, like I have a book on St. Joseph that's coming out. I wrote in the year of St. Joseph, which he's a wonderful, uh, great patron saint for me and for every father. He should be their, their first patron as a dad and as a husband. And then finally, just some other things, Catholic Answers has asked me to write a book on the Beatitudes that I'm working on right now. So those are the things, those are my projects in my free time. My, that's just, my hobby. Free time. <laughs> those are my hobbies. <laughs> Wonderful. The fruit I'm of free. all that prayer. Wonderful. So, well, thank you so much, Father, for it's sharing my pleasure. Your, your testimony, thank both you. about um, coming to the Catholic Church, as well as your vocation story and your advice. Uh, just some wonderful Wonderful tidbits in this episode. Thank you so much. Thank you. God bless you and your ministry. Yeah. And thank you for joining us for this episode of the Journey Home program. I pray that Father Sebastian's uh, story was an inspiration to you, as well as his, his advice on discerning vocation, as well as um, helping your kids stay Catholic. Just some wonderful stuff there. 
I want to remind you, again, if you are on a journey, if you're thinking about becoming Catholic or coming back to the Catholic faith, we'd love to, to walk with you on that and pray for you and assist you in any way we can. If you uh, check out chnetwork.org and click Community, we have a community of converts as well as people who are on the journey to the Catholic Church that are praying for each other, helping each other answer questions, uh, helping each other continue that journey one step at a time. So check that out at chnetwork.org. Once again, thank you for joining us for this episode of the Journey Home program. God bless you. We'll talk to you again next week.